The Dharma, incomparably profound and exquisite, is rarely met with even in hundreds of thousands of millions of kalpas. We now can see it, hear it, accept and hold it. May we realize the true mind of the Tathagata. Today is the seventh and final day of this first of two uh, session here at the beginning of 2023. This is January 28th, uh, and we are at Mountain Gate in northern New Mexico. And I'd like to share with you a little bit more of the writings of Mark Epstein, who is a notable psychiatrist. I'm sure he's quite a good psychiatrist, actually, and also a longtime Buddhist practitioner. His training is in Zen, but he also has had experience, at least in conversation, with Tibetan Buddhists, uh, teachers, and Vipassana teachers. And of course, the truth is arrayed in many different forms, just as people have many different forms. When Mark was in high school, as you heard yesterday, he asked his, his fellow high school students, all 47 of them, if any of them felt um, had a nagging sense of emptiness. And all but one, and that was the, uh, the, the head football player in the high school, said, yes. This is all uh, from his book, uh, and he's written a number of books, all of which I would advise you to go ahead and read, particularly as Zen students. Um, this is from Going to Pieces Without Falling Apart. This emptiness that he spoke of is something that tends to plague everyone, and we fill it with whatever means seems uh, closest at hand and most effective, although none of it is really, truly effective, uh, unless we get into spiritual work and go very deep into spiritual work and go very deeply into that sense of emptiness, which most of us hold at arm's length. There are many ways people escape. I don't need to enumerate them. Um, just recently, there's been a big brouhaha about the DEA uh, representatives from the states in Mexico um, supposedly um, misusing funds. It's not 100% clear that that was actually going on, but nonetheless, um, uh, there's uh, an incredible rise in the number of fentanyl deaths in the United States uh, that seems to correspond with the Mexican government's change of position instead of uh, arresting the kingpins of the, the narcotics trade. They are working on social services to try to help people <clears throat> not get into drugs. I'm not sure that's going to work because I think there are two different directions, um, but that's not for us to discuss here. This emptiness, we all come to Zazen because there's something that feels like it's missing out of our life. And what is missing out of our life is really living. We distance ourselves from truly living. Some of that comes as a result of how we are uh, treated as, as children, but that doesn't mean it needs to be permanent. It can be worked with, and particularly through meditation, uh, it can be effectively worked with. It takes time, takes uh, commitment, takes presence, takes a willingness to walk courageously into this sense of whatever you want to call it, being nobody. Uh, one person called it being outside the universe and not let in. Uh, there's all kinds of, of ways that can be felt. And when we grow up in challenging circumstances, uh, it can be exacerbated. According to Epstein, he, when, uh, when parents, <laughs> our helicopter parents, 
that makes it difficult for a child to become um, familiar with and able to open to uh, a, a being alone with their own beingness, which uh, is something of a prerequisite to uh, exploring that mysterious emptiness, nothingness, uh, except it's not nothing. As the scroll behind us says, out of not one thing, and that is that famous emptiness with a capital E, arise the 10,000 things. If we hold ourselves apart from those painful feelings of being um, separate, of not being 100% complete, uh, then we rob ourselves of profound fulfillment in life that is really everyone's right and and an access to uh, mysterious experience of beingness that is beyond words and that is rich and fulfilling and we can carry that into our daily life as well we start with extending the out breath and daring to extend it as far as we can and daring to not step outside of it and run alongside of it but really to ride it with curiosity with openness to possibility and we do that again and again and again and it begins to uh, train our mind it begins to give us a, a something of a sense of confidence um, in walking to any anxiety that may come up with that practice. And uh, for many people, it, it is a challenge to truly exhale as fully as we can exhale. Uh, Mark talks about when he realized when he was 30 years old and on his honeymoon at a hotel in a pool that um, he swam underwater and never breathed out when he was swimming. This came as a result of when he was five and he, his parents took him to uh, the local um, club that they had just joined and um, he was uh, taught, well, uh, there was an attempt made to teach him how to swim. And the way it was done was the lifeguard would uh, jumped into the water held out his hands about a foot or two away from, from Mark, who was instructed to swim toward him. And Mark had the last thing in the world he wanted to do was swim toward this guy, uh, whatever reason, uh, or go, go anywhere near him. Uh, it may have been instinctive, who knows? He doesn't get into that, but at any rate, um, he refused lessons from then on and finally taught himself how to swim by swimming underwater and holding his breath the whole time and not breathing out, uh, which might must have been quite the, the task. I know that, uh, I can't remember what it was, where it was, but I think it had to do with uh, when my grandson was in basic training to enter the Navy. Um, that's a, a, a very harsh training uh, that is meant to thin out the ranks and leave only the most uh, capable in, in the Navy's terms, uh, strong, brave, and so on, uh, left to actually be welcomed into the Navy. And one of the things they had to do was to swim from one end of the other uh, in a pool uh, without holding their, uh, without breathing. I mean, they had to go underwater and they, they had to do it without breathing. Of course, you don't want to breathe underwater, uh, except perhaps to exhale. Um, anyway, um, it was representative in Mark's life to how he held tension in his body. And he struggled through uh, his psychiatric training to understand ways to uh, get rid of this feeling, pervasive feeling of emptiness that he felt. He was at a uh, long summer training at Naropa Institute, going to all the classes, and he was um, sort of 
dismayed by the fact that his roommate, they had two roommates and they were twins. They were sons of a Jewish grocer. And they spent their time uh, not going to these classes, but going off to markets and buying boxes of fruit and vegetables. And, and uh, one day, uh, when it was clear that they were sort of looking at him with uh, twinkles in their eyes, um, they offered to teach him how to juggle. And so he, he did. It, it was a learning experience at which he had to concentrate. And he suddenly found, he realized as he was juggling that the tension in his shoulders had released. That was because he was so focused on the actual physical experience of juggling. <coughs> <coughs> and, and this is what can happen to us when we forget ourselves. When we surrender to the moment, the moment's experience, which means tuning into our body and simply feeling the energy that is there in the moment. I spoke yesterday of that experience of forgetting that I had an appointment and, and realizing suddenly I had uh, this whole hour in which to sit in the glorious spring sunshine in the midst of an incredibly intense life and how wondrous it was, how relaxing it was, how amazing it was because I was able simply to be there. It was such an amazing luxury. We don't afford ourselves such luxuries. Uh, and as Mark has pointed out, a certain amount of that can come, excuse me, as a result of either helicopter parents who constantly monitor every single moment of a child's life uh, or parents who are, are uh, simply not there, it, whether physically or emotionally. And, and so uh, children don't get the chance, the natural opportunity to open to an inner exploration for which one has to feel safe. And the result of that is we feel empty, lacking, um, unworthy, and a lot of other negative things. Of course, parents try to do their best. Uh, they often have their own issues, and unfortunately that gets translated down the, the, uh, to children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and so on, and, and it's a sad, sad situation that that can happen. But there is a way out. And it starts with the out breath. And it starts with walking courageously into allowing yourself to dare to feel the anxiety, to dare to let go your hold on uh, an essential feeling of needing to be in control, at least for the length of the breath. And as we gradually continue with that more and more, our mind begins to expand and open, and we begin to slowly see more. We begin to slowly, slowly free ourselves of the tension, of the need to control. And this is why he talks about um, uh, going to pieces without falling apart. In other words, letting go our attempts to maintain uh, control in, our, uh, in order to feel safe. <coughs> <coughs> and it's, it's essential if we are truly to become free. I think of the elderly Catholic women in Rochester, New York, who my then daughter-in-law was, was nursing. And she commented to me at how they would, they would die clutching their crucifixes, terrified of death, terrified of letting go, really, 
because that's what death is. It's, it's a required letting go. You have no choice. <coughs> you are removed from your persona with death. But, as Shido Bunan famously wrote, if you die before you die, you won't die when you die. That means with every breath, you work at just becoming the experience of breathing out. And in that is a tiny little bit of dying, just a tiny fraction of dying, of letting go who you think you are, who you think you have to be, daring to be unsafe. Here in this beautiful little zendo, in this wonderfully harmonious sangha, it is safe to do so, but it may not feel that way because of our conditioning. And we gradually work on it little by little. By little. And over time, however long it takes, we begin to uh, let go in very important ways. And in letting go, what can come up then is the feelings, the sensations that we have buried in order not to feel because they're so painful or so frightening. And then we have the second opportunity to walk into those sensations and allow ourselves to be with them and curious, what might they reveal to us that we hadn't realized before? And not, not necessarily psychologically, not necessarily about something dreadful that happened to us when we were growing up, but something deep and mysterious, something freeing, something fulfilling. When we dare to open, this becomes possible. I don't know why I'm coughing so much, except that my mouth is dry. And I'm sorry to interrupt things so frequently here. Yeah, that would help. Thank you. I'm running out. So let's see if we can um, come up with some quotes from Mark. If I can get this iPad working. Thank you. taken a lot of notes from this book. One of the first things noted is we are looking for a way to feel more real. But we do not realize that to feel more real, we have to push ourselves further into the unknown. And that's what the extended out breath does. One person, more than one person actually, has, has said that they feel like uh, they're a fake, they feel like they're an, an imposter. In a certain sense, um, the public image of us is fake. It's not real. It's, it's a mask that we put on, a charade that we engage in in order to feel part of the universe. And the irony is that everybody does that with very few exceptions. Every once in a long while, one might meet someone who doesn't play that game, but most of humanity does. And it results in feeling empty, feeling like you 
something's missing and something really is. It's a connection with being and capital B. And again, a, a proven way to connect with that being is to dare to extend the out breath and let go of this felt need of being in control, of being on top of things, of existing. And we can't do it by choosing to let go. The only way we can do it is by exhaling and opening to the anxiety that comes forth as we are doing so over and over again. Becoming familiar with the sensation in our body of that anxiety, of that discomfort, not trying to avoid it through the many ways we have to avoid these things. And we gradually, gradually begin to feel more safe in that space of not knowing. And then we continue going deeper into it and deeper yet, and ultimately completely forgetting ourselves in what is known as samadhi. When we are completely one with that experience of the outbreath, with that openness to possibility, and we forget ourselves, that is a prerequisite for enlightenment. And enlightenment is what most people come to Zen practice for, uh, at least overtly. What we really come for is some way out of this feeling of being nobody, of being fake, of being an imposter, of not knowing who we really are, and yet having a sense that there's something we're out of touch with, which is quite accurate. Because when we ride above life, we are out of touch with reality. We're living in a story, and the story is not completely fulfilling. In fact, it's largely unfulfilling. Yet, to simply be, 100% be, in a moment, even a short moment, can be amazing. And I, I bring forth again the story I mentioned yesterday uh, about the elderly woman who, at the end of this incredibly tumultuous frightening, terrifying uh, day filled with death and uncertainty as the Kobe earthquake hit in the morning. At sunset, she is standing on a pile of rubble, gazing at this amazing sunset, transfixed at the miracle of being there in this glory, glorious sunset. This is available to us as well. She didn't, she didn't stay there. I'm sure she went to try to find some way to house herself and make sure that her neighbors were okay and, and uh, dig right in to helping people uh, survive that uh, incredible experience. It's interesting that uh, we we at Sogenji, I was living there at the time, went uh, several times a week, every week, beginning with the day after the earthquake, to help in whatever way we could relieve that suffering. Uh, the Roshi always went, and it depended on what was needed, what we did. At one point, uh, we spent several days uh, preparing uh, donated vegetables from the neighbors to uh, and and taking these enormous walks that were probably three feet in diameter and um, little little propane tanks and burners uh, and taking it all to Kobe and setting up a little uh, restaurant in in the street in the ruined streets um, and feeding over 300 people with the food that was donated. We cooked it and, and served it, and people who were starving, people who had no homes, people who had lost their jobs, people who had lost family, uh, were able at least to eat. Early on, just before that, we went 
and um, we engaged uh, volunteers with uh, trucks with cranes, for example, and we went to clear, help clear the streets of all the obstructions uh, that were caused when things fell down. Um, and then we did the the cooking. We did um, we did that more than once, I believe. And we also, at one point, the the local police in Okayama, where Sogenji is, um, periodically donated um, bicycles that had been retrieved, that had been stolen or had abandoned, and donated them to Sogenji, which is why we could have bicycles there to get around in, and it was quite expensive to, to um, take a, a bus into town, which was not very far. And it, it was uh, something like a $5, $6 round trip to go into town and back uh, on a bus. And we just didn't have that kind of money. So, but we had these beautiful little bicycles that had been repaired and donated. And at one point, uh, we collected a whole bunch of them and transported them to Kobe to be donated to people who who needed to have some way of getting around. Of course, the local transportation system was quite in disarray because of the destruction of the streets, the destruction of the rail lines, the destruction of the the uh, equivalent to the interstate. Um, everything was uh, amazingly destroyed but at least people could get around with bicycle. We did various other things. And the last thing we did, interestingly enough, was six months later. By then, they were beginning to repair the Shinkansen tracks. I think they were beginning to repair them quite before that, but they finally were getting them repaired six months later. Uh, and uh, a lot of clearing had been done, a lot of uh, work to restore the city to the degree that could be restored had been done. But there was one pervading problem still remaining, and that was the population that had been impacted by that severe earthquake were devastated. The men were wandering around deeply depressed. Um, they had lost jobs, they had lost family, they had lost homes. Uh, and they didn't know how to deal with it. Uh, the women fared somewhat better. They uh, Somehow there's something about women that were used to um, stepping in and, and uh, adjusting, perhaps because we need to being the child bearers. Uh, and so it was decided that, uh, in fact, we were asked to do this, the uh, a group of actors and, and uh, and actresses gathered together to uh, help lift the morale of the people of Kobe who had been so badly impacted. And they asked us to um, do something. And so we came up with this skit, which was um, a, a foreigner's first day in Japan. And it was hilarious. They performed it before us. Um, before they went to Kobe and, and did it in public. And, and it was just amazing. There are a lot of situations in Japan, particularly in those days, that were um, quite puzzling and amusing to foreigners. And, and foreigners couldn't figure out how to, how to work around them as well. And they took a number of these different instances and uh, mimed them. Uh, it, was, it was great. Uh, and apparently a great success. So, who are we? These people in Kobe who had lost everything, who were desperately trying to cling to some something that they could feel safe around. And we, all over the world, regardless of whether we've lost even, even we in, in a first world country are challenged with these feelings of worthlessness, of emptiness, of, of not being. And yet, with this simple tool of extending the out-breath, we can become 
free to explore that and open to its riches and no longer be caught in any level of devastation or sadness or depression around it. It is miraculous, really, and it works. So if you um, want to be inspired a little bit with some of the psychological aspects, uh, Mark Epstein has written a number of books. Uh, one of them is called Thoughts Without a Thinker, which could perhaps provoke some interest in you. And then there's this one, Going to Pieces Without Falling Apart, and there are several others. Um, he's very thoughtful. He shares his own experiences, his search for meaning, his search for a way to help his patients truly become free without turning them into little Buddhists. And um, it, they're worth reading. This is somebody who has a long history of Buddhist practice. Uh, he was doing meditation uh, when he was in college and then went on to become a psychiatrist and continued doing meditation uh, all along in, in, um, and continues it to this day. So uh, I think I've covered pretty much everything that you need to know in order to free yourself other than the fact that yes it is possible and yes you can do it and yes it will be tremendous it will be tremendous work you'll have to walk through where you're caught but in doing so that will free you, and it will be so amazingly worth it. So thank you for listening. We'll stop now and recite the four vows.